was hoping there'd be a few less people. <laughs> no, should be fine. Um, my name is Simon. I work for Catalyst IT. Um, I've been there a few months now. Um, and welcome to my talk, a medley of uh, paradigms. So Python is started as a multi-paradigm language. And it supports the big three paradigms, procedural, object-oriented, and functional. Um, but what are those? Uh, where did they come from, and what do they mean? So we're going to start uh, by looking at um, procedural, since that's where most people start to learn Python with. Um, it's really sort of the basic building blocks of a Python script. Um, so that's where we're going to start. So I'd like to take you back to the beginning. Um, in 1947, at a symposium of the large-scale digital calculating machinery, John Morchley said, well, he posed the idea that it is possible to evolve a coding instruction for placing subroutines in the memory at places known to the machine and in such a way that they may easily be called into use. One can designate a subroutine A as division, a subroutine B as complex multiplication, and so on through the list of subroutines needed for a particular problem. Uh, John, John Morchley and his team of researchers at the University of Pennsylvania were calculating uh, missile trajectories on the ENIAC uh, computer, the Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. Um, hilariously, it's labeled as the world's first large-scale general-purpose computer. Um, they didn't know about the computer at Bletchley, which was still classified at the time, um, but they did believe it to be the first. Um, large-scale one. Um, fast forward a decade, and electronic computing is enabling scientific bodies of scientific research in the engineering calculations never thought um, possible before. Uh, programs were largely written in assembly uh, and must be specifically designed for the computing hardware available to the researcher um, at their university or lab. Um, now, for many researchers, writing assembly was another core competency. Um, and tight coupling between the assembly code and the computing hardware makes it really hard to share the programs with other researchers, especially researchers from other institutions which were using different hardware. Um, so there was not a very good knowledge sharing there. Um, so because of this, there was a growing urgency to come up with a portable high-level language um, that researchers can use to write their programs in. Um, and their programs were mostly mathematical calculations. So in uh, 19, 1956, um, IBM published their, their first manual of Fortran. Um, Fortran is the formula translating system, and it uh, transforms mathematical formulas into machine code that can be computed on their IBM uh, 74 mainframe computer. Um, like previous attempts at such uh, automatic code coding, uh, their system Fortran was met with a lot of skepticism. Um, how could machine code produced by another machine possibly outperform my meticulously, tediously handcrafted assembly code? Well, IBM claimed that uh, Fortran set itself apart from other compilers um, because it was a groundbreaking optimized compiler. Um, and true, uh, it was pretty good. Um, but more importantly, writing programs in Fortran reduced the number of programming statements um, by about a factor of 20. So writing in Fortran was a hell of a lot easier. And for most, the practicality and ease of writing programs in Fortran outweighed any perceived, um, sorry, any perceived uh, loss of efficiency uh, from writing in Fortran over assembly. So, Surely scientists and engineers were queuing up with stacks and stacks of punch cards containing uh, their programs for all sorts of scientific marvels, uh, numeric weather prediction, crystallography, fluid dynamics. Um, I don't know what this program here actually does, but apparently there's 62,000 cards there. And they're all meticulously hand-punched. 
So the first Fortran specification only had um, 32 statements. Uh, there was some I.O. for reading and writing to the punch card, some other control statements, but just only three flow control statements. They had a, um, a go-to statement, um, which allowed the programmer to jump to any arbitrary line in the code. They had a do loop, and they had a very, very primitive if construct. And that if construct was primitive, um, it would let you evaluate a mathematical expression and depending on the output of the expression, either negative, zero, or positive, let you jump to a arbitrary line in the code. So on the top line are the uh, lines that um, that statement will jump to if it's uh, negative, zero, or positive. Um, so it's a really, really prim primitive if construct. And this would later be superseded by a more powerful construct, um, a logical if. But it wouldn't be until 1997 before else and else if constructs would be introduced to the language. Um, so that's quite a time difference before they arrived. Um, but in the meantime, by contrast, just two years after the first release of Fortran, uh, IBM published the second specification. And that specification added just six new statements to the language. Um, and that was the call subroutine function common return and end. Um, so they had just added the concept of procedure calls to the language. Uh, in the same year, the first version of Algo 58 was released, and it also supported, um, it also supported procedural programming. Um, now, these, fun these statements didn't just introduce uh, keywords in the code. It introduced new functionality, including the idea of scope as well. So it's the full ecosystem for um, trying to make function calls and managing the life cycle of um, subroutines. So the idea of using reusable subroutines and functions had just exploded into the mainstream uh, in both Fortran and Algo 58. Um, but as with any shiny new toy, uh, as programmers, we would proceed to misunderstand abuse, and generally make a mess of it. Um, some clear best practices and worst practices emerged. But in addition to Fortran's go-to statement, which allows programs to, uh, programmers to jump around to arbitrary lines, there was an additional entry statement, which allowed programmers to jump into an arbitrary line inside a function. And this was a disaster. So. In 1968, um, Dijkstra penned a letter to uh, the American uh, Computing Magazine uh, decrying the use of the go-to. Um, the problem with the go-to is that it completely invalidates, um, it completely invalidates any higher-level code structure. And uh, the letter that he wrote was titled A Case Against the Go-To Statement. And his comments were scathing. The quality of programmers is a decreasing function of the density of go-to statements in the programs they produce. Um, now, this was published, and the editor took some editorial liberties. And uh, at the time of publish, it was titled uh, Go-To Considered Harmful. It was uh, more attention-seeking. Uh, but Dijkstra would go on to publish a book in 1977 called Structured Programming. Um, and this was written in collaboration with several other academics and pr proposed some ideas for cleaning up the mess of go-to and entry and just writing generally better procedural code. So the ideas that they proposed in this book were that any computable program is computable by combining, combining sub-programs in just three ways. Um, the first way is sequence, running one subprogram after another. And sorry, I should clarify. When this is subprogram, this could either be a, uh, a function which returns a value, or a subroutine which uh, takes an action. Um, but in this case, subprogram could mean either. So it will run one function after another, or one, fun one subroutine after another. The next way of combining them is uh, by evaluating some sort of conditional, and depending on the output of that conditional, jumping to one, uh, sub one sub program or the other. 
Or finally, looping over um, a variable and repeating the same subprogram, or this could be combined with the first one and repeating a couple of different subprograms. So all three of those can, can be combined in any way to compute any computable function. And so in this way, programs can be entirely broken down um, hierarchically from the top. And more profoundly, any block code inside of a, uh, sorry, any block of code inside the if statement or while statement could be moved to a subprogram and replaced with a procedure call. Um, and these ideas here um, describe pretty much procedural um, programming best practices as we understand them today. But this way of thinking is very top-down and hierarchical, which is an okay way to describe a system. Um, but the, rea the reality of building something from the top down is less ideal. And in reality, programs really start to look like this. And so we have functions and subroutines calling other functions and subroutines and branches that, there are, that aren't their own. And on paper, at least, it looks like a mess. But in practice, what we would call this is actually just code reuse. Um, so this observation has been made about um, the problem with programming um, hierarchically from the top down, and that um, everything should be built from the top down. It's a great way to read a program. So everything should be built from the top down, except the first time. So if not top-down, then what? So we come to object-oriented. Um, object-oriented or originated in Norway in 1967. Um, researchers working for the defense establishment designing nuclear reactor systems needed a way to model, model and simulate how events flow through their uh, complex system. They were currently running these simulations on a Ferranti Mercury computer in a low-level language, and the computer at that time was using um, these, these vacuum switches, um, and they needed replacing quite regularly. But the programmers desired a high-level uh, abstraction for describing the properties and behaviors of components of the system and proposed a simulation language. Rather than build their own language from scratch, the researchers took ALGO 60 and extended it with classes, objects, and inheritance. And this language was called uh, Simula. So classes in the first spec of Simula uh, consisted of a bunch of member variables and just one single procedure, which described the behavior of the object. Um, the discrete event model that they were using uh, was increasingly being used to model other domains, communication systems, traffic flow, social systems. So they generalized the language for modeling any kind of object that a programmer might want to model. And because of all this high-level abstraction, uh, Simula was slow, really slow. But in 1985, um, Bjorn Strushup came along and he was looking for something similar for C. Uh, C was a great language, fast, down to the middle, but it laid the high level abstractions that he was looking for. And so he went and took the best parts of Simula, in his opinion, objects and classes, and turned them into C++. And so the first version of C++ was a little more than really just C with classes. And that was fast, that was down to the middle, that was the best of both worlds. And the rest is really history for OOP. Uh, nearly every modern programming language today supports some form of OOP. Um, there are countless textbooks written about it. Um, there's a lot of uh, negative attention towards it as well. Um, but it really hasn't changed that much in the last few years. The next one that I want to talk about is um, functional programming. And functional programming is a radically different way of thinking. Um, there are no classes, there are no scopes, just functions. The concept of a function is based on lambda calculus. And in lambda calculus, functions look like this. And so what that's telling us is that uh, there's some function that takes an input y, 
an input x, and outputs the result of x plus y. So it sums the two inputs. In Python, we can express that like this, and um, compared to the lambda calculus, it's pretty much the same. Um, you can just translate directly back and forth. Um, but it's not very Pythonic. Uh, it's not really the way we like to write and read Python. Um, so we can actually just write it like this. And that's a pretty ordinary function. Um, there's not really that much interesting about it. It's extremely um, trivial. But what's interesting about it? Well, it doesn't have any internal state. What about this function? Does this function contain internal state? So this function uh, takes the integer n and calculates, um, sorry, it iterates up to n, calculating the square of every number on the way. And the question is, does it contain state? Well, the answer is yes. The iterator in the for loop is state. Um, that i value is changing. Um, and while we're not managing that ourselves manually, um, it is being managed automatically by Python, and it is uh, state. But what if we were to rewrite this function and um, remove the need for state at all? Well, we could write it like this. And so this produces perfectly equivalent output. Um, it will loop over all integers uh, from 1 to n and print out the square of the integer. But now we have no state. We're not setting any variables. We're not changing any variables. We're just passing numbers um, up and down the core stack. And so this is really great. This is what we mean by no state in functions. But there's a problem in Python. And that is, what happens if we do this? Well, this function is defined recursively. So you'll find pretty quickly we get this. Now, uh, this is where Python diverges from pure functional languages like Lisp and Haskell. Um, Python put, puts guards in and refuses to recurse um, down too far. Unless you override it, there is a system, a system setting you can set at runtime to override that, and I've done it once in the most disgusting script I ever wrote. Um, but generally, it's not recommended, and it's just it's not a good idea. Python also doesn't support tail recursion. Tail recursion is a concept uh, of, uh, like, like the previous function, um, recursively calling itself, but as the last call of the function. And in classic uh, functional languages, that's a highly optimized call. It's a common pattern, and the, the interpreters, the compilers, um, are geared for exactly that type of pattern. It's almost a free call. But not in Python. Python does have some good stuff going for it, though. In Python, functions are a first-class object, which means that you can do with functions anything you can do with a uh, normal object. Uh, you can assign them to variables. Uh, you can pass them to functions as parameters. You can return them from functions as return values, and uh, you can store, store them in objects as member variables. So functions which take, uh, sorry, higher functions are functions which take um, other functions as parameters. And that's sort of like the next step into the functional pattern. And Python gives us some pretty good, good tools out of the box to do this. Um, so th these are all um, built in into the standard library. They're built in functions. And they really help make the code more readable. Filter is a function which lets us um, easily uh, search through a list for a value in that list which matches a certain value. And we can define our function and then just pass the function in by name. So if we consider this, um, this function which is not functional, um, it calculates, uh, sorry, it searches through a list and finds all the even numbers. And it's still pretty trivial, like five lines. Um, and you can see at the bottom of the output, it, 
correctly finds um, in that list the two, the two even numbers. Um, but we can write this even more nicely and easily uh, just with a call to the filter function. So we define an even simpler function, is even. Check if n is even. And if it is, then uh, filter does all the work. It just selects uh, all values from the list where that function returns true. So it's a really elegant, neat way of, um, of simplifying our code and just utilizing um, the built-in functional tools that Python gives us. Another example is the map function. Um, so given, given an iterable and uh, given a function, um, it would just transform all the values in that um, iterable. And so we can look at a non-functional example that doubles every, every item in a list. And again, trivial, uh, five lines of code. It just produces um, a list where every element is twice the value of the elements in the original list. But we can do it in three lines of code. Well, two lines of code by defining a double, which just doubles in, and then we give that function to the map function of Python. And that's it. Um, this is a slight lie, because what map returns is actually not a, um, a list. It returns a map object. I think it's a generator. And so you actually need to call a list on that to convert it to a list. Um, but without converting it, you can still iterate over it. And I think you can at least get the length of it. Um, but yeah, it's really easy. Um, and it cleans up the code a lot. It makes it more readable. Um, so reduces from the func tools module. And that module is pretty much full of a lot of, a lot of more functional tools, um, but not so common ones. And some of them are not as Pythonic. Um, but reduce is a useful one. Um, it allows us to reduce all the items in a list down to a single value. Um, so for example, if you wanted to sum up all the items on the list, um, and it's actually that's the, that's the example I have, if we want to sum up all the items in the list, we can re use reduce for that. So ordinarily, we could just iterate over the list and sum the total, and then return the total. But using reduce, which you do actually need to import from the uh, func tools library, then again, we just define a really simple uh, one-line function. There's only one line in the body of the function. And we pass that function to the reduce tool, and it does all the work for us. And we're not maintaining any state. Um, and our code is beautiful. So does this mean Python supports functional programming? Um, it does have a lot of functional programming tools. It was heavily inspired by Lisp, uh, sorry, by Lisp. But it doesn't really. Python took the good parts of functional, but it really stuck to what it's good at, which is readable code and um, just clear, concise, um, straight, straightforward code. Nothing too fancy. But that doesn't mean we can't still think about functional programming, and it doesn't mean we um, can't take the good parts and learn the lessons to be learned from functional programming. And Python's a great place to start playing with these tools, and then you can go away and play in Lisp, or you can play in Haskell, um, but you can learn the fundamentals in Python. And that's my talk.